Have you ever been blindsided in finances, relationships, or something else? My guest today, Andy Wren, is going to share several examples. Andy, what are the most recent ones? Well, I have an employee that worked for me who was getting divorced and her spouse decided to get some credit cards in her name and he charged up $26,000 of extravagant stuff in her name before they got divorced. That was one. Um, We have somebody who found out that their spouse had taken out over $300,000 in loans to pay for vacations and cars and things like that to make it look like they had more money than they did. And they had no idea that their spouse wasn't able to afford that lifestyle. Um, Another one, um, somebody who'd been married for 44 years and 40 years, she was a caretaker because he had a brain, uh, a brain tumor and then later got cancer and some other things. And now he had dementia. And after 40 years of being a caregiver, he decided that she was mean and he just walked out and left her and moved in with their son. Um, Then another one was an almost hundred thousand dollar gambling debt that the spouse didn't know about. And that, you know, is just crazy stuff that, that comes up. People are blindsided all the time. In today's episode, we're going to talk about those examples of being blindsided and so much more as Andy Wren tells us why she is so passionate about helping people create their financial independence, especially after being blindsided. Welcome, Andy Wren. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. You know so much, and you're going to do a better job introducing yourself than I am. So tell us what led you to become a financial expert. Well, I always was very frugal with money, and I had um, started dating this nice young man, and then we decided to get married. And I would not let us get married before he paid off all his debts. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, so he had to pay off all his debts before we got married. And then we moved in together after he got married or we got married and we lived off my income and saved everything that he made. And then that allowed us when we moved, we're a military family. So we PCS to the next location and sold the house that I had had prior to our marriage. And we paid cash for our first house and oh. <laughs> we got on the base and Um, I started my business because people needed to know who I was before they knew who he was, (laughs) before he became a commander. And I started writing articles for the base about how to save money and things like that. And I started working with people who um, like their spouse was deployed and I would help them pay down their debt and, you know, make a plan. And then I found out that people do this for a living. And I went, what? So I found the accredited financial counselor. Um, certification. I applied houses and I got that in 2007. And then in 2008, I started managing a program for the military for personal financial counselors around the globe. And I spent 16 years creating trainings for the financial professionals and hiring them and and making sure they knew what they were talking about when it came to military. So when I decided to retire after 16 years, um, because this was my second career, right? I started at 40. Um, So at 55, I decided I was going to use that IRS rule of 55 and retire from the corporate world. And that was a really great decision, but I stayed on as a military subject matter expert for a little while, part-time, and I help a lot of people out when they have questions. Um, Along this path, though, I also got a marriage and family therapy license because to me, I loved helping people with their money, but I love the behavioral side of that too. And that helped me work with couples and individuals on the behavioral aspects of personal finance. Absolutely, because we know that financial disagreements, personalities, spending habits, saving habits, past history, shame, all the feelings can really influence the health of the of the relationship, right? 
They do. They do. They're, you know, the top three reasons people get divorced, you know, one of those is finances. And, mm -hmm. and I think one of the others, a lot of times is child rearing discrepancies. And a mm -hmm. lot of that touches money too, because I'm, put, I'm spending this much on my kids activities or their clothing or whatever. And people fight about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited that we're going to get to talk about this. And in the kind of teaser introduction, you talked about being blindsided. And before we get to some of those examples, I'd like to start with your personal blindsided oh, story. Own. Yeah. Yeah. My own example um, that I talk to a lot of people. So now I have a program where I help people uh, become financial counselors or better counselors, because I work on communication, rapport, trust, that kind of thing with your clients. And I use in my mock counseling sessions, my own scenario, because as a military widow, so my husband retired medically from the military after 26 years, and he had PTSD and he was suicidal for three years before he passed away. So money became something that he was really worried about. And and so that was, that's one thing that you just never know how somebody's mind is going to go when they have a mental situation, you yeah. know, they might hyper-focus on something and he was pretty hyper-focused on the money. Um, but of course I took care of everything. <laughs> so <laughs> that was good, but there were some things that happened that I don't think a lot of people think about when somebody dies and some of it can be you know, let's talk life insurance, right? If somebody dies in a hospital, the doctor has been treating them for something and they die of that cause, you're going to have a death certificate finalized right away. But if something happens and it was an accident or like he was out at our land and he just collapsed and his heart stopped is what they said. And that requires an autopsy, blood work, all this stuff. It took eight months to get a final death certificate. So if we had our life insurance in place, it still wouldn't have mattered for eight months. I wouldn't have had it. I think a lot of people don't realize that if you have an unwitnessed death and then there's always the investigation and autopsy. And until you get that death certificate, a lot of times your finances can be frozen. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It could be, it can be really tough. Um, and the bad part was, I, you know, was very much in line with paying all my debts as fast as I can, even though we had a house for sale, we had a second mortgage where we had just fixed up the kitchens and bathrooms before we went to sell it uh, because we decided we didn't need two houses, you know, because we we're like, kids are gone. Yay. Um, but, you know, I had just thrown all the money we had in our checking account towards that, that, um, HELOC. And so here I had like $5,000 for all my bills for the next couple months, you know, while I waited for things. So it, you could be blindsided. So having that emergency savings is really important now because the HELOC was active. I could have taken money out of there if I needed to, but you know, there's many people that maybe they don't have that ability to. What does that stand for? What did you call it? The HELOC? Home equity line of credit. Okay. Okay. So it's like when you do improvements to your home or something like that, you can get a loan for a certain amount of money. And how much do you suggest people have in their emergency fund? Sometimes they say six months of living expenses. Well, there, there are discrepancies, um, kind of, it depends on what kind of income you have and, and that kind of thing. Um, I had an income, thankfully I had a job. I was working full time. I made decent money. Um, I see three to six months professional saying three to six months. And then I see six months to 12 months also. Okay. So yeah. I really think, you know, sometimes it takes people a while to get a job if they lost a job. That's probably the scariest thing yeah. now um, with a death that that's a totally different thing. So having, you know, and some people, like I had a coworker that when they lost a child, she didn't work for eight weeks. Right. And I didn't, I didn't take a day off until it was time for the funeral, which also took eight months. So 
Oh, because golly. Arlington National Cemetery has a waiting list. <laughs> okay. All these things that people don't think about and our military connection, I didn't even tell people how I know Andy. We met at the Military Money Convention back in Nashville, Tennessee in 2023. And when I was looking for speakers on making decisions on finance, uh, Adrian Ross, who I have had as a guest, said, oh, you definitely need to reach out to Andy. And Andy's breadth and depth of knowledge is, it's a little overwhelming for somebody like me who's not very financially oriented, but I'm learning. And I think that's the encouragement for people that it can sound confusing and overwhelming, but you can get there, right? Right, right. And one of the things that I think for death also, there's a couple more things that I found is that we had a life insurance policy that we decided we didn't want to pay for it anymore because it was kind of getting higher because he was older. And so we were, we called and asked, Hey, do you, you know, what do we need to do to cancel this? And they said, Oh, just don't pay it. So we didn't pay it because we were getting ready to sell that house. We we're like, we don't need it because everything's paid for all our stuff was paid for. We had money. If we needed a car, we could get one, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and thankfully there was a grace period there. Yes. Because pay within a week of the day that I would have had to make that payment. So um, did you great. listeners, did you catch that? They stopped the payment on the life insurance and he passed away five days later. Yeah. the Yeah. Yeah. And luckily you knew enough to ask about the grace period. So you could just make that payment right within that 30 days. Yeah, I did. I did make the payment. I don't even think I needed to, but I did make the payment just to make sure that, you know, timing wise, there would be no discrepancy there. Um, but you have a 30 day grace period, typically, if you've missed a payment on a life insurance policy. And I've heard lots of people over the years that, oh, our life insurance policy just, you know, canceled or whatever. And, and luckily, my dad was paying attention to that when he passed away, because he kept his going and and that's something that happens sometimes when people are in the hospital or things like that, they'll kind of have, if they don't have it on auto pay, then it might get missed. Mm. Uh, another thing that I learned was about spousal allowance. So okay. I'm not sure every state's rules on spousal allowance. Okay. Spousal allowance um, at the time of his death, it gave up to $30,000 to a spouse in North Carolina. So let's say something didn't have a beneficiary or um, a pay on death. And they, um, a pay on death. What does that yeah. mean? Is that part oh. of a policy? Yeah, it can, different accounts have different things. So if somebody dies and they have a pay on death listed, then that would be the beneficiary basically okay. of the item. Um, some states actually have it on cars, vehicles. Some states have it, you know, it, how you title your house makes a difference too. Okay. So you want to make sure that all your stuff is titled the way you want it to be. So that that way automatically it goes to the other person. Whatever you can get to automatically happen or to go to the person that you want it to go to is, is the best thing you can do. So are you saying that in general, it's best to have both names on car titles and home mortgage documents? Yeah, well, one of our um, situations was our vehicles because when he was active duty, the state of North Carolina, which is where he was from. We didn't live here, but we didn't have to pay property taxes on our vehicles if he was listed as the owner of the vehicles. So four of our trailer, truck, car, <laughs> boat were all listed on under his name. So that's what I used for my spousal allowance. Okay. That's how I got those transferred into my name because those were items that didn't have a pay on death or a listed beneficiary. Well, just because this is so new for me and maybe other listeners are wondering if like, wait a minute. So the $30,000, what does that mean? You're not taxed on that amount or? I mean, it automatically can go to me without it going through the court system and probate. Okay. Okay. So let's say, I, I think uh, we talked about this example. Let's say he had a stock account that he didn't have beneficiaries listed 
and he had $26,000 in there. I could have used that $30,000 spousal allowance to say, Hey, I want this 26,000 to be something I receive without having to wait and go through probate. Okay. So it's getting access sooner, access sooner to that money. Okay. And the probate process is when it goes through the courts. Yes. Right. Okay. And we had everything titled except for the cars. We had everything titled. So it would automatically go to the other person. And so the only thing that would have had to go through probate would have been anything that didn't fall in that spousal allowance. Okay. Which we didn't have anything. So that worked out really well. Oh, wow. Wow. That's, I mean, that's really amazing looking for some of this. Now you did mention something before we pressed record and it was talking about waiting for the death certificate in order to get payments and pay for the funerals. And there was a different part that was talking about military allowance. So for our listeners who are military spouses or retirees, the VA will pay up to 2000 towards um, burial expenses for deaths on or after September 11, 2001, and up to 1500 for deaths prior to September 11, 2001. So um, that that was kind of nice to know that even a very inex like we had a very inexpensive you know he wanted to be cremated so he was cremated and then we had a service in his hometown like that weekend like just a memorial yeah. and that alone was about 4500 not including the meal thing that I did afterwards with the family, we rented a place and brought everybody together for a meal and celebration of life is what we do in our family. And um, so that 2000 was reimbursed later on. I had to send in my receipts and things like that. So, well, I think this language sometimes is helpful for people, whether they're military or civilian, just to sometimes have a ballpark of, you know, what's the cheapest you can bury someone Um, some people go all out and can spend tens of thousands of dollars on a burial caskets, ceremonies, memorials, um, and all of that. So I appreciate you sharing. Wow. That's a a tough topic. How did you become, how did you become comfortable talking about this? Lots of practice. Um, the counseling program that I help people earn their hours to become accredited financial counselors. Um, I started with giving people an option between two different mock counselings that they did and everybody picked military widow as okay. their choice. So I just, I went through this probably 50 times with what happened. Oh, my husband just died. So we would go through the whole thing. And I've had a lot of people who are like, Oh my God, this is your real story. How do you do this every time? And I'm like, you just get good at it. You know, it's it, talking about it can make it healthy too. So but well, people learn so much because they would have to do research in between sessions and yeah. learn about um, dependent indemnity compensation. So that's if the death is service connected, that's about $1,600 a month that you would get if you get that awarded. Well, Survivor benefit plan is 55% of their retirement pay or if an active duty death of what the retirement would be at that time. So there's lots of really specific things for military death. These are really important things for people to know. And, you know, unfortunately, we've known many spouses who have lost their spouse uh, during active duty, sometimes post-retirement, but sometimes you have to check that documentation back to see if it's at all related to where they were serving, if they were exposed to any chemicals. Um, and, And that's worth fighting for, even though it's a long process. So it's definitely important to have a support system and financial planners who have that behavioral counseling piece to kind of shepherd you through to get to the right people at the right time. So wow, that's a, that's a lot of amazing information, Andy. In kind of closing out your story, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Because you had said, and I don't know if we captured this on the recording, but you had come from a corporate life and helping financial people. And then they kept you on as the subject matter, ex- subject matter expert because you know so much. And then you created these curriculums to help other people kind of build their financial knowledge. 
What else did I leave out? What else did I leave out? Oh my gosh. I, um, I don't know. Well, I've been, I just finished, uh, being AFCPE board of director president. So that's, uh, for the financial certifying body for the accredited financial counselor. Um, tell me what those letters stand for again. Association for financial counseling, planning, education. Okay. Yeah. Those, those letters get all jumbled. Perfect. I know they do. So, um, yeah, I, w- I'm past president this year in 2024. So yay. I made it through the rough year <laughs> of being president. We had a lot of great changes that we did there. Um, but I, I really, I just absolutely love helping people be better financial professionals. That's one thing that I've really enjoyed a lot. I do um, a book study also where people earn continuing education hours to, and usually it's a behavioral finance book. So we're getting ready to do Atomic Habits and they'll earn eight continuing egg credits. And so it's for CFP, CHFC, and AFCs. We are going to talk more about all those acronyms in our next one. So if you're confused of what those are, just you're, you're along with me and you're not alone. We're going to understand some of those because at the military money convention, my eyes were just glazed over with more acronyms. And as a military spouse, there were so many anyway, it's really hard to keep up with. Um, But I wanted to circle back to some of those scenarios that you mentioned at the very beginning of other people being blindsided, not just you with the, and again, I'm so sorry for that situation and your loss of how complex, because you were very happily married. Uh, I was, I was blessed with a good one. (laughs) And I appreciate you sharing that. And I think before we press record, you had shared, Hey, that was my second marriage, Hillary. So, you know, people need to know that. There's, There's hope. hope. I wasn't There's even hope. looking. He found me, <laughs> chased me down, hunted. <laughs> I just joke about that, but he, you know, he, he, he saw, I'm glad he did because I was lucky to have a love like that. I'm so grateful for you to share kind of that hope because sometimes dating on the other side is not necessarily easy. And sometimes you can tell a lot about a person by how they act on a date. Did you want to share a little snippet of that before we go back to your examples? Yeah. So you learn about people's financial situations on a date, even if you don't think you're going to. Um, I met somebody and went out with them and they talked about like five different cars that they owned And then when they went to leave, they were like, oh, I'm going to pay. And, and I was a little hesitant because I typically pay for my own stuff. And then the person left less than a 10% tip. And it just was like, I was so embarrassed. Yikes. Yeah. For those of you who don't watch the YouTube channel, uh, my face was a yikes face of, yeah, that's an important, that's an important. Mine was a yikes face too. I was like, ooh. I did let him know that that was not appropriate. Oh, yeah. Feedback. Yeah. So yeah, good. Yeah. We're not a match. <laughs> well, and sometimes that's helpful of like who is a match and who is not a match, right? They both inform us as we move forward for sure. Oh goodness. Okay. Well now let's talk about some of those early situations where people were blindsided and what your advice to them maybe um, would be or was um, first interesting. I'm going to bring up the person married over 40 years and a husband walked out. You said something very interesting before we recorded. Well, um, I, it's really, that was a really tough one because she was, had her own disability. And so she was on social security disability. And then right after he left, she was getting ready to have surgery and social security disability, um, determined that she made too much money and they stopped paying her. So from October until we talked in December, she hadn't gotten a payment and she had to find a new place to live. She ended up moving in with a sister and a nephew. And I spent 
time with her on the phone with social security, trying to work out, you know, the whole situation and, and getting it reinstated. And she's about to turn 65. And so they were like, don't take your retirement early. That's what social security determined for her. It would be better for her to get her. Um, so she has an appointment this week to um, have a doctor look at her and get her disability back up and running so that she can put off her social security dis uh, retirement check until she's full retirement age. Okay. In 10 months or no, it's not 10 months. It's December of 2025. Okay. Now you said something interesting that you recommended that she'd be better off not getting a divorce. Was that right? Yes. Yeah. So he is a veteran. Um, he did not retire, but he is a veteran. And so his injuries could be service connected and that possibility could help her with some income after he passes away. And then there, you know, it, she would may be better off using his social security, you know, when she gets older too. And so there are just lots of things that, and even if they got divorced because they've been married for longer than a certain amount of time, she would be able to claim his social security um, once he files for it. But there are a lot of things, you know, that it's so expensive to get divorced a lot of times and with his health and his dementia and you never know what's going to happen. It would probably be better not even to waste their time doing huh. the divorce. Not like anybody's going to be dating or going out. Neither one of them are interested in that. They just, he just decided he didn't want to live with her anymore because she was mean. <laughs> That's okay. what he said. Well, does she have any recourse to not get divorced? I mean, can you just stay living separately indefinitely? You can. Somebody has to file for divorce for it to happen. Okay. Hmm. But then you've got those other examples of being blindsided where people were hiding debts and those kinds of issues. So when is someone liable for their unknowing... No. That one example about the person who used to work for me, and this is before in the financial world, this is, um, but that, that one, putting a freeze on her credit could have helped her and, and a couple of these situations, somebody wouldn't have been able to take credit out in her name if she had a credit freeze without her knowing, without her being notified because all of those exam, well, two of those example it was a husband taking out a loan in the wife's name. And if she had a credit freeze, they wouldn't have been able to get credit in her name without notification. So does that mean on our credit checks or whatever, we just need to set alerts when, or how do you, how do you set that Notification. The system. process is really easy. You go to the three credit reporting bureaus, Trans TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, and you put a credit freeze. Um, you will have something that you can lift your credit. So I have a credit free. I've had a credit freeze on me for about nine years now. Okay. And I forgot about it. And I went to go get uh, we were changing cell phone plans and I went, oh no, I have to lift my credit freeze so that they can check my credit so that I can get this new account. So I'm sitting in the store doing the little thing on my phone to lift it for a day. And you can lift it for 24 hours, for a month, you know, whatever you need um, for everything to be checked. So if like somebody's going to buy a new house, they might be shopping for loans Okay. And so we might want it open for two or three weeks so that that way the credit can be checked okay. when it's by the financial institution. Wow. That is really interesting. Wow. And I'm trying to think of the other situations like for usually my audience is usually women after 40. Um, but I know sometimes we have men as well. Are there any cautionary tales that people need to be kind of on the lookout for um, so that they're not blindsided? Is there a way to prevent it? Wow. Some things you can't just, I mean, sometimes you know a person and you think you know a person 
and then something completely opposite outside their normal behavior happens. Yeah. And, you know, like the gambling debt, like that person had no idea that their partner was out there gambling and taking on, you know, extreme debt for that. That's really, you know, that's really difficult. So I'm sure it's very helpful when you can offer that kind of support to them. Wow. One of the things that I think is really helpful for couples, especially is to have money dates. I think having a monthly money date, once you've gotten a really good rhythm and pattern or whatever, it could be quarterly, but having a money date is very helpful where it's a set time. You know, you're going to be talking about your finances. You're going to walk through, you know, at the beginning, you're going to walk through all the pieces of your finances together. And then you might have something say, okay, um, this month, we're going to do this. This month, we're going to do this. This month, we're going to do this. And we're going to check in on our goals. How are we doing? Where are we at? Um, this is one thing that my husband and I used to tell people that we also did before we got married is check each other's credit before we get married. Okay. That, I think that's a very valid, uh, <laughs> people laugh that we did that, but we did it. We, <laughs> it's like, I know my credit's good. What's yours. And he always was mad because my credit score has always been higher than his. So that was, well, I'm like, that's Okay. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> That's right. I think your credit score is probably higher than most of ours. And you know, on that note, let people know what's a good range for a credit score for the general person. I think generally anything 740 and above is fine, uh, is really good. I should say uh, there's a lot of people are like, oh, I really need it over 800 you don't really need it over 800. Like, that's great. It's gravy. But that's like, you know, when I take a test and it's pass fail and I'm freaking out because I didn't get hundred percent or 95% and I got like 85. It doesn't matter. It was pass fail. That's so right. you, you know, anything 740 and above is great because you're going to get offered lower interest rates. And, um, that does one thing people don't think about is that your credit score actually can impact your insurance rates. Really? Like for health and auto like car, home? yeah like a car and home if you have bad credit it can make your rates for insurance higher huh fascinating well i know we have so much more to talk about i just want to kind of review what we've learned so far so i'm so grateful that you shared that very personal story of you being blindsided by the passing of your spouse and you taught us that there's a spousal allowance, an amount that you get to kind of have access to. And at your time in the state of North Carolina, it was $30,000. These always vary by state. So people have to look at that. You also talked about, um, oh, and the reason was because then it doesn't have to go through the courts and through probate. So easier access. Certainly the challenge of needing a death certificate with an unwitnessed death, it can take longer. So people need to have a certain amount of money set aside in savings for living expenses, funeral expenses. If they are a veteran, they might get up to then $2,000 VA to help cover the costs. But as you shared, yours was you know close to $4,500 just for the basic celebration of life, cremation, et cetera. Um, Let's see, having vehicles in both your names could have been a more helpful thing. Did I get that right? Definitely. It definitely would have helped me be able to transfer the, the vehicles over. Um, now that was in 2015. So it's a little bit different now because it's a $60,000 allowance. And I think part of the reason that they have that allowance is so that the vehicle can be transferred. It, you know, because even I had just bought him a new car before we got married and I got a loan. So it would help our credit scores, but both of our names were on it. So I only had to, I, I was one of those people that I'm like, I'll get a car loan and I'll pay it off in a year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just to help the credit score. <laughs> that does help the credit score, which I think is a super helpful tip. Really good. Um, well, I really liked that you, you know, check credit scores on uh, someone you're dating before you're getting serious and, you know, making sure that they're paying off their debt to own that. Um, yeah. And I'm just blown away that you paid cash for your first house. I think 
you know, hashtag life goals, pretty amazing. Um, yeah. And I appreciate I'm, I'm one of those fans of buying a fixer upper, yeah. usually cosmetic. I love that. It's a little harder to do now since the, since the COVID housing craziness. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I really took away so much for your money, monthly money date suggestions, you know, set a time each month. And then once it gets really easy, it can go to quarterly talk about your financial goals, what you're spending, where it's going and, you know, really and check in with kids, the kids. Well, and if you have kids, you can make it every other month for the whole family and every other month for just the couple. Yeah. I really love that. And that a credit score over 740 is great. So good. Andy Wren, you have taught me so much. I just, part of me thinks I just want to work for you so I can learn all these things and take all these courses, be in these book clubs. Oh my goodness. What a great community. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me, Hillary. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Andy, you've got a fantastic fun fact, which is really an encouragement for all of us. Will you share that please? Yeah. So the fun fact that I have is that my mother-in-law told me that the fifties were her best years of her life. The kids are typically on their own. You have the energy and are healthy enough to travel and do what you want. So I tried to embrace that. And what I've really done is what I want, when I want, how I want, and with who I want. And that's a really fantastic thing. And that's part of the piece of retiring in my fifties was so that I could go out and have a good time. I love that. I am so encouraged. Thanks.